right. So um, let me start by thanking the organizers for inviting me and for putting me on the agenda. It's really a pleasure. Uh, it's a nice forum. So I hope I can um, kick off an, an interesting discussion afterwards. Uh, I've been told to talk 45 to about 60 minutes. I haven't had a run through, so I hope my slides aren't way too short or way too long. Let's see. Um, a brief disclosure beforehand, the funding has already been mentioned. And I think it's important to mention that I do have an interest in the standing of one of those non-pharmacological interventions that I'll be talking about. Um, I don't think it affects my, my perception of that necessarily, or my, my client, um, but I think it's good to, to declare that. No other um, noteworthy conflicts of interests here. The focus of the talk is going to be non-pharmacological therapies, and specifically we'll be looking at how placebo effects play out in clinical trials and in clinical practice, but we start off with a few mechanistic considerations. So let's start off um, looking at these therapies. It's a pretty mixed bag involving everything from talking therapies to dry needling or acupuncture over a whole range of manual therapies, so hands-on therapies such as osteopathy, but also chiropractic, massage, some physio components. Um, physio also strongly represented here in the exercise component. It might also involve nutritional interventions, um, device-based things. You see a shockwave gun there. It could also be therapeutic ultrasound, transcranial nerve stimulation, uh, transcranial current stimulation. Could also involve surgical interventions. I'll be focusing mainly on those physical and psychological interventions. So non-pharmacological, non-surgical non-needle-based, um, but I think many of the principles are, are a bit more broadly applicable. Now, most of those non-pharmacological interventions rely on the person administration of an intervention. If you're thinking of manual therapy, it's really hard to separate that from that person who's um, applying the therapy. It involves considerable personal interactions that will differ depending on the practitioner, and on the patient that's who's involved, you may be thinking of psychotherapy if you have a background in, in psychology, for example. Uh, the interactions are quite unique to each individual patient encounter, or if you would like to each therapeutic um, diet or pair. Interventions usually involve multiple steps. So physio treatment might involve numerous exercises or a whole, a whole exercise plan. And that's usually also um, implies that these therapies aren't a one-off, they are durational, often takes half an hour, 45 minutes for each session, and they are repetitive. You're, we may be seeing someone several times a week or at least once a week, um, and that keeps on recurring. There's also a certain ritualistic element about it. If I describe to you what, a, what an osteopathy treatment starts off with, um, the patient enters the room, sit down, have a conversation for 10 minutes about how they are and about their their um, their condition or whatever they, they present with. And then both practitioner and, and patient stand up and the practitioner asks the patient to usually undress to their underwear or uh, however much they're comfortable with. And then you go through a sequence of, of hands-on per patient. You feel the back, you feel the neck, and you ask them to do certain movements. There's something very ritualistic and repetitive about that. Uh, but you can also think of, of an exercise routine or yoga studio um, where you have that sort of first session and you introduce to the class and then you go through, go through that ritual every time you go there. These treatments are also very multisensorial, yeah? Um, you may be thinking of, your, of the, the smell in a yoga studio, for example, or if you... In Germany, you may be familiar with the smell of a homeopathy studio, which is exactly the same as the smell of a Waldorf kindergarten, by the way. Um, and in hands-on therapies, obviously, we're talking about, about the experience of being touched, which may be quite pleasant, maybe less pleasant in other, in other circumstances. Often, these intervention lists are trained to identify what's wrong, in quotation mark. And they provide treatment rationale linked to the intervention. And it's often considered best practice 
to explain to the patient what's going on. Whether or not that's scientifically sound is a completely different different matter. Um, but if you've ever seen a physio, if you've ever seen uh, even a homeopath or a, a nutritionist, they will say what you're deficient in and how they can they can fix you essentially. So there's that reason that comes with the intervention. Oh look what that what's that? That's a text from my sister-in-law recommending an osteopath. He should be he's good. She says and he's only eighty quid an hour. He points that out because it's much cheaper than what he sees, which is the 30, 135 pounds per uh, euros per, per hour. So often you go and see individual practitioners based on someone's recommendation, person recommendations or word of mouth. As my sister-in-law has just demonstrated here, these treatments can also be rather expensive and they are often site-specific. If we sum it up, they are definitely considered contextually rich. We could say, okay, are they more contextually rich than a, than a drug or, or pharma context? And I think the important thing here is that the context is inherent to those treatments. You can't, be, you can't reduce those, uh, the context considerably without losing the essence of many of those interventions. So if you think about a drug, you could have a triage through a chatbot and you have an on online pharmacy to get your, your headache painkiller, but that really works much less with most of those complex non-pharmacological interventions. They're contextually rich, and they're also meaningful. And when I search meaningful in that context, uh, the first thing that Google showed me were a couple of YouTube videos on crystal healing, crystals, and how they work and what their meanings are. So again, undermine, uh, underlining the importance of a rationale and a, a narrative that comes with some of those treatments. That's been termed the meaning response in 2002 by Dan Merman and Wayne Jones. Certainly, I find a useful conceptualization of, of the placebo effect in some regard. So you can see where I'm going with this, describing interventions such as these as contextually rich. Um, it both affects the, the meaning, uh, but also the perception of the participant or the patient and the experience that they have when they expose themselves to one of those non-pharmacological therapies. And as Lena Vaz has written in the same year, the subject's perception of the placebo agent seems to be central to the magnitude of placebo analgesia. So the patient's perception, how they experience this seems to be crucial. You'll all be familiar with the principal driving factors, mechanisms of, of placebo effects. So there we have expectations, and we also have conditioning and learning um, mechanisms. And it's worthwhile dwelling on those briefly and think about them in the context of non-pharmacological treatments. So in terms of conditioning, where might we have, for example, a subconscious pairing of stimuli? So you may have a brief um, pain relief if you go and see a, a physio or if you get a, a brief, um, if you get a cortisol injection, for example, you may have a couple of days pain relief and you may come to experience, uh, come to associate that benefit with the circumstances and the environment and the context under which that treatment was delivered. That makes it more likely for that treatment benefit to occur again. We also have an element of observational learning, certainly. Um, as I said, a lot of those Therapies are recommended based on personal connections and networks. Um, or you may be sitting in the in the treatment room and someone else comes out of the out of the wait uh, out of the you, you may be sitting in the waiting area and someone else may be coming out of the treatment room saying, Oh, I feel so much better already. You've got that social learning element um, that certainly can be quite strong in these in these interventions. So let's try and unpack this a little bit further thinking about the different components of the treatment, which of those might actually influence the patient's expectations rather than the, um, the, the actual treatment mechanism that, that uh, the patient providers are aiming to target. We get back to that question of what contextual and what specific or, or treatment effect in a little while. So there we have factors that are associated with the provider. You'll all be familiar with those from the, from the um, from the placebo literature, but again, I invite you to think about them specifically in the context of non-pharmacological interventions. 
you've got those reputational factors of the provider, um, the the sort of almost uh, metaphorical metaphorical certificate on the wall. How this person here, the provider, is dressed, you can clearly see who's the who's the practitioner, who's not. So we do have an element here of often slightly hierarchical or even patriarchal uh, relationships in some of those treatments. And we have beliefs and behaviors that providers are trained in and that they communicate consciously or subconsciously. Then we have patient factors. And these will be very similar to, um, to what you know from, from drug literature. You have preferences and previous experience. And you have demographics and clinical factors that will influence how they create or develop conscious expectations or expectancies. And then a really strong element here in these in these treatments, um, however, often regarded as contextual, is the the therapeutic alliance or the, the therapeutic relationship, ideally based on trust and on good, skillful, deliberate communication, but not always, certainly. And then we have factors inherent in the treatment. You get a diagnosis, you get an explanation, they will, the providers will give you some kind of prognosis. So that's a verbal suggestion of um, treatment outcomes, essentially. You've got different styles that you might or might, might not get with. So a stronger treatment approach or a more personal or a more calm and gentle approach, depending on the therapy you're looking at. And then many of those treatments are personalized to your, to your needs and to your expectations, potentially. We've spoken about the sensations and the potential for immediate or short-term pain relief. Uh, it's worthwhile noting that most randomized controlled trials really don't find long-term pain relief from any of those interventions. Um, so I guess that stimulus pairing might be, might be quite an important element here. And then we have the amount of treatment that may differ, obviously. And then if we zoom out a little bit, we talk about the immediate treatment setting and its environment, the price, but we also talk about the social cultural context in which that treatment happens. So you may be living in a society where it's quite normal to go and see someone else for your, for your problems, um, or where, where the belief in sort of medical authority is relatively strong. Or you may be living in a society where the belief in in religious um, instances is is much more important, or in spiritual elements. So you can see how um, the social cultural context may be changing the framing or your expectations that result from your interactions with a treatment provider. Now, how do those then? change outcomes. Um, I'm not going to dwell too much on placebo analgesia mechanisms here. Um, just to remind you of all the different pathways and mechanisms involved in, in pain relief from placebo effects. Um, obviously, we could also talk about other, other symptoms. Um, but is it just those classical placebo effects that we need to be talking about here when we talk about context factors and placebo or related mechanisms? in non-pharmacological interventions, because all of those experiences will have a bearing on how people feel emotionally, how they react um, in terms of their, their stress or relaxation responses, and context will also shape how they behave in response to the treatment, again, consciously or subconsciously. You may have other mechanisms on, the psycholo on a psychological level other than expectancies and expectations and learning for example, um, fear responses or dampened fear responses um, or certain behavioral and compulsive elements that may be reinforced or dampened down based on your interactions. So here's a, an attempt from the psychology field to try and structure what they call the common factors, so those elements of the treatment that they don't consider to be immediately responsible for um, for treatment effects or that aren't inherent in the theory of a treatment um, model. So we have those interaction factors here, the positive relationship, and then process related factors where emotional dimensions and cognitive dimensions are, are affected. And then action results from, from those or from immediate um, experiences within the treatment um, 
and, that, and you can see how these then might be um, interacting with other aspects of the therapy. It brings us to the question of, okay, in these, if the stuff is so complex, um, what of what's contextual and, and what's and what's a specific factor in these in these interventions? And it's really not easy to tell, but what um, Anne Kinsipfer, for example, wrote is that what might typically be considered a common or non-specific or contextual factor factor in a drug therapy, for example, who delivers it and where is it delivered, um, or what's said while the drug is administered, might become a specific element in a non-pharmacological intervention. So it might be important to come to a fitness studio for your exercise intervention, or it might be important um who gives you the instructions to perform the exercise in a certain way it might be important how you take the exercise in quotation marks while no one will really tell you how and in in which environment and context you should be taking your your headache pills but that doesn't mean that all these elements in a in a pharmacological inter, in a non-pharmacological interventions are necessarily straightly linked to the placebo effect but but disentangling specific and non-specific effects becomes super tricky. Even so much that what might be considered specific in one therapy may be considered non-specific in another. And an example that I like to use there is that in many manual therapy trials, a gentle laying on of hands is often considered or used as the control intervention, so as a placebo control intervention. But then you have other um, and you have a whole school of thought around what's called therapeutic touch, which is essentially laying on of hands with a certain therapeutic intention. From the outside, certainly not distinguishable from what's used as a control intervention in a different context. You can also look into the acupuncture field and the dry needling field. So acupuncture would be the term used for traditional um, sort of Eastern philosophies of using needles to relieve certain symptoms and in that model it's very important where you stick the needles because you're expecting certain energy flows and meridians mapped across the body in dry needling or western medical acupuncture it's much more about relaxing muscle tension um, and putting needles into tight muscles so you might have a Chinese acupuncture trial being sham controlled with just sticking the needles into, into the deltoid muscle. Um, and you may have a dry needling trial where sticking a needle into the deltoid muscle is the actual treatment. So it's really hard to disentangle and inherently link to the, to the, um, to the treatment model and rationale that's underlying many of those, many of those treatments. Specific and non-specific factors may of course, interact. So if you're thinking of you're trying to uh, lose weight and you're seeing, a, you're seeing a fitness instructor for that, if you have a good relationship with that person, you may simply be more inclined to continue um, the weight loss program than you may be if you don't like the gym and if you don't like that, that instructor. So contextual factors may um, reinforce or, or um, become a barrier to treatment outcomes and treatment factors. I've spoken about the challenge of, of um, even delineating the, the mechanisms of many of those therapies, and that when we talk about designing control interventions later on, certainly becomes a problem as well. So then, here's an example from the manual therapy world again about what we think how some of those treatments may be, may be working. And I can guarantee you that a graph or a diagram from the psychology field or anything else wouldn't look, way, wouldn't look particularly more simple or straightforward. If you compare that to a drug, uh, ideally you have a sort of target, targeted mechanism and a, and a key to lock situation. While here it looks a bit more like a, like a shotgun approach looking at mechanisms of, of physiological effects. So here in the top right corner, um, this author in particular included nonspecific factors and responses, including placebo and expectation mechanisms. I think there are a couple of arrows missing, so you can see how that then is mediated as placebo analgesia that would affect the pain 
modulating with the central pain signature. Um, you will also have an, an emotional and autonomic response. So essentially, you can make this diagram even more messy and say all, all this upright corner here is, is more or less linked to contextual factors. Important to note, however, that most of the training and education in the non-pharmacological field is situated in the lower part of that diagram. So um, speaking from own experience, the, the, the training in, in manual therapy, for example, focuses very much on mechanisms uh, that are out in the tissues and, and musculoskeletal system, maybe in the spinal cord, but certainly not reinforcing the importance of, of context factors and, and the therapeutic relationship. Um, certainly not to the extent that it could be could be emphasized. Um, I don't think I need to provide definitions of the placebo and nocebo effects uh, here, but because it's recorded and I don't know who else will, will watch it, I think it's useful to remind ourselves of this here as well. So the placebo and nocebo effect really only referring to changes specifically attributable to those placebo and nocebo mechanisms. And that these mechanisms are shaped or influenced or triggered by, for example, verbal instruction, nonverbal, and situational cues that go via expectancies. And I'd also like to use this opportunity to distinguish that again from placebo and nocebo responses, which is any kind of change in your health condition resulting after administration of a placebo. So that may or may not be mediated through those placebo mechanisms. And we look at the distinction between those later on again. So having described those um, non-pharmacological interventions as potentially quite susceptible and liable to placebo effects because of their richness and context, that leaves us with a couple of questions. One is, well, how impactful are those placebo effects actually in psychological and physical um, therapies? And the other question I'd like you to consider is how will we ever know if these interventions do actually work better than placebo effects if they are so complicated and so rich in context? Let's start off with the first one, trying to measure placebo effects in this, in this physical and psychological context. A couple of ways of doing that, uh, depending on your research background, you may be more familiar with experimental studies where you try and get healthy participants or a group of people with a certain condition into the lab and try and modulate their expectancies to any of those contextual, uh, contextual process-related factors that we mentioned. Such studies do indicate that there's a moderate and sometimes even large effect on various, often patient-reported symptoms in healthy and in in patient populations, and you've got various factors influencing those, um, including the amount of treatment exposure or the strength of the suggestion, the relationship of the patient with the provider, and many of the other ones that we mentioned already. And then you have evidence synthesis studies. So where you're trying to pool randomized control trials, usually put them together and meta-analyze what the effects are, and arguably, um, these randomized controlled trials are a little bit closer to clinical practice, a, bit, a little bit more complex. Uh, you're looking at um, measuring outcomes often further down the line than, than what would be seen in, in many experimental settings or lab settings. Um, but you obviously have much more heterogeneity um, and influences for, for potential bias. So um, it's good practice to put several randomized controlled trials together and, and meta-analyze them. Many of those meta-analyses really focus on the placebo response. So they look at changes from the beginning of the placebo treatment to the end. And there are very few that look at, at comparing that to a no treatment control group, which would be required to actually um, evaluate the magnitude of the placebo effect itself. Where that's done, um, it suggests small effects, and especially for patient reported outcomes. So usually more subjective outcomes such as pain feeling, um, allergic responses, etc., and less so for for um, more objective outcomes 
such as death or time for hospitalization. But um, the quality of those evidence, evidence syntheses and the um, underlying methodological challenges of those randomized controlled trials means that we can't be 100% certain here. So I'll present um, an updated review of that in a second. Before we come to that, um, this is a review that was part of my, my PhD project where we aim to systematically review physical and psychological intervention trials for pain that use placebo or so-called sham control arms. The objectives were to describe those clinical trials and say how are these control interventions designed, how they're justified, but then also ideally to quantify and measure the relationship between how those control interventions are designed and the outcomes of those trials. So it doesn't matter what you use as a placebo control intervention for example, based on uh, for, for the clinical results that you might find, but also for how many participants are still uh, part of your trial at the end of the study, so how much attrition did you have, etc. Don't get scared with that graph, I'll talk you through it and I'll zoom in in a second, but what we found were 198 randomized controlled trials, a pretty big sample, and we split that up into different types of manual therapy trials, these are the first three blue uh, bars here, spine manipulation therapy, gentle craniosacral therapies, and other manual therapies that would be massage and, and joint movements. And then we have exercise-based interventions, and lastly in pink, psychologically-based or self-management educational interventions. So let's zoom in onto the upper part of this, of this graph. And what we did in this systematic review was to compare the treatment, the test treatment, and the control intervention across 25 different features, um, specifically looking at how similar or dissimilar control intervention and test treatment were for those. And the top part here in the green box are elements that are usually quite well matched. So the further to the right the bar, the more likely or the more frequently these elements were matched. So the environment of the treatment and of the control intervention were usually matched in all of those studies. That's the um, second from, from last bar here in the green box, and frequency, treatment duration, similarly um, matched. Yeah, here's the zoom. So um, you can also see that that's pretty similar across the different types of interventions that we looked at. But if we then go further down, you can see much more variability here. For example, um, you have the psychology trial sticking out here on the left on bar that says thematic content of the sessions. So your psychology intervention may have been around fear avoidance and sort of pain self-management strategies clearly touching on those relevant topics, but your attention control or your, your placebo control intervention in these trials would often then have avoided discussions around those um, related topics. And you can then start to appreciate how that might have had an effect on the expectations that were formed in the control intervention arm. If you go into a trial for, for back pain and no one ever talks about pain with you or, or only in a very, very general context or, or manner, um, that might, might shape your expectations uh, differently. You might not necessarily feel heard or that might not feel particularly relevant to you. In the dark blue bars here sticking out to the left, these are physio and exercise interventions. Often what was used there as a control intervention were detuned ultrasound devices. So things like how that felt and how that was applied uh, to participants was very different. Again, thinking back to the definition that I gave you earlier about the importance of participants' perception with regards to their treatment experience, you can see how that might shape expectancies differently to going and seeing a physiotherapist for an exercise intervention. We then tried to quantify that, and I'll talk you through that in a second. But first of all, we described uh, the current situation in the, in the sham controlled RCT field, and there was no standardization of control intervention design. So everyone did um, what they thought was best. It was hard to see a common theme, maybe other than in spinal manipulation trials, where people really quite frequently tried to 
produce control interventions that really resembled the treatment under investigation. So a fake, a fake spinal cracking, essentially, if you like. But even there, it was rare that somebody reported why they did what they did. And it was also very infrequent that they had some quality assurance step beforehand where they said, okay, let's let's get some healthy participants into the into the lab and test whether if we can if we can trick them into believing it's an actual intervention, let's measure their expectations, let's see um, if what we're planning to do in this randomized controlled trial actually works out. If they did that, they rarely reported it. Um, also, during the trial, quality assurance would have been, for example, asking participants afterwards to guess in which group they were in, and that was, again, rarely done. We then performed a meta-regression analysis where we tried to see if the similarity uh, scoring that we had performed was associated with trial outcomes. And it was, and in particular, the elements uh, that we already touched on seem to have had a bearing on pain-related outcomes in those studies. So how you design a control intervention will affect, will bias, if you like, um, the clinical findings that you get from a randomized controlled trial. So this is a more, more recent work, uh, just been accepted on, on Saturday in the European Journal of Pain. I hope you can, you can access that in the next few days. And what we looked at here were three armed randomized controlled trials, basically a, a spin-off or an update of that, of that earlier systematic review, but we only picked up trials that also, in addition to a treatment and a control intervention, had no treatment arm. And that, like I said before, allows you to compare the changes in the, in the control interventions and placebo control intervention to the group that didn't get any intervention, and that is um, then cancelling out regression to the mean effects of changes that happen over time anyway and allows you to quantify the actual placebo effect. So the effect stemming from those expectancy-related um, context-driven factors. The aim of that systematic review was to quantify the magnitude of placebo effect. Again, we're talking about physical and psychological interventions in a pain context. We also were hoping to get an idea of how long these effects would last if they, if they existed. Uh, I can tell you now that we weren't able to do that. We only had five studies that looked beyond four weeks, um, and there certainly wasn't any effect to be found anymore. Um, and we also wanted to contrast the or, or quantify the contribution of the placebo effect to the overall treatment effectiveness. I'll illustrate that in a second. What we got were 20 RCTs, out of which 17 we were able to meta-analyze. They had sufficient data and good, good data reporting. And this is what the sample looked like. Let me just glance over that for a second. Basically, um, a sample dominated by musculoskeletal pain, chronic pain, relatively small studies with an average of 52 participants per study arm. So they always had at least three study arms, 150 participants on average for each trial. 60% um, were manual therapy trials, very much underrepresented, also in the earlier systematic review by psychological RCTs. And that's because uh, controlled or efficacy trials, placebo controlled trials, are an absolute rarity in that field. Same for exercise interventions, by the way. And the control interventions consisted of switched off ultrasound devices and manual hands-on simulated maneuvers or soft touch interventions to equal degrees and a miscellaneous group of seven other controlled interventions which would involve things like uh, listening to, to white noise on headphones or an open label saline injection or um, what else do we have in there? There was one relaxation study where people floated in, in, a, in a relaxation tank, some kind of water. They had changed the settings on that one um, for the control intervention. So a pretty mixed bag. And blinding um, was not always an objective in, in, those, in those trials. Uh, 
that's the the forest plot of the main analysis where we compared the changes in the no treatment arm to the changes in the control intervention arm and you can see at the bottom that we found a standardized mean difference of 2.21 uh, which is generally considered a small effect size but it was significant and we split the sample up into manual hands-on based control interventions into those disabled ultrasound devices and into that mixed other group and found considerable differences here with large effects in the manually controlled trials. So larger placebo effects in those five studies here. Here's a nice way of illustrating that. The overall size of that bar signifies the effectiveness of the treatment. So that's what you get when you compare the treatment group to the no treatment group, typically called an effectiveness study. If you're comparing a placebo group to the um, treatment group, that's what you what you talk, talk about in terms of efficacy. Um, and if you compare the placebo group to the no treatment group, then we quantify the blue bar or blue part of the bar here, which is the placebo effect. So you can see that in the total sample of 17 studies, the placebo effect contributed almost 40% of the overall treatment effectiveness. Um, and the effect was also pretty um, reliable, but it differed when we split this into um, different types of control interventions. That's what I showed to you earlier. And what's interesting here is that the magnitude of the placebo effect, so the size of the blue bar, differed considerably. But if you compare manual control interventions, the second bar, to the other control interventions, um, both the treatment effectiveness seemed to have been relatively similar. Um, but if you had done only efficacy trials, so only trials with a placebo arm and a treatment arm, you would have found that this, the therapies in the, in the other controls group would have been much more efficacious than the manual therapy interventions. And it's really only with this analysis where you compare where you quantify the placebo effect, that you start to appreciate that it's it's really the the magnitude of the placebo effect um, that that drives that makes manual manual controlled or manually controlled intervention trials look much less efficacious than the others. So the main takeaway here, I think, is that the design of the control interventions um, can is is really important information about interpreting clinical trials. So when, from this body of work, we, we can say that in experimental studies, the placebo effects are typically much larger, but in clinical trials, they are present and placebo effects contribute significantly to outcomes. It seems to really depend on the experience of the participant and the amount of exposure to contextual factors. And we weren't always able to quantify how much that was linked to the credibility of the treatment or to the, the effectiveness when it came to blinding. Um, we get back into that in a second. There are a couple of open questions here. Um, we do need to know a little bit more about the temporal aspect of, of placebo effects. So how long do they actually last? How do they interact with those specific treatment components? And are we able to quantify that in, in whatever way? And then I think predicting placebo effects um, in individual situations is going to be almost impossible, even in the long run, um, because of those situational differences and, and the inter-individual differences of, of how expectations are, are pre-shaped and the experiences and, and emotional baggage that people bring into, into therapeutic encounters. How do those findings translate into real-world practice? Again, something I'll touch on later. And then, how about nocebo effects in non-pharmacological trials? That's something that's much better studied in, in drug trials, uh, famously with sort of modifying information about adverse events or adverse effects of drugs, but much less done in non-pharmacological interventions, many of which, by the way, are considered much safer and, and less harmful. So what we do need is more high quality control interventions and more standardization. Um, imagine all of those trials were well reported, well conducted, 
and we were able to really access the reasoning of the of the authors behind uh, what they did and if they had measured blinding effectiveness and expectations of, of treatment participants we would have been able to produce a much more um, comprehensive and and say and um, reliable view of the of the the evidence and literature so with that thought in mind we're going into the last section here which is about um, efficacy trials and mechanistic studies and then a couple of slides on the clinical relevance in case you're a therapist and interested in, in that sort of stuff so let's get back to our almost melancholic reflective questions how will we know if these interventions work beyond placebo effects and here it's useful to briefly reflect on evidence generation in, in clinical trials or for clinical um, therapies in, in general. So we've been focusing really on the question, does this treatment work under ideal circumstances or better than placebo effects? And that's what you call an efficacy question or, or placebo control trial conducted for that. You're also familiar with experimental studies where we can either test mechanisms of treatments, if we modulate those, or if we measure physiologic, physiological pathways, and the same is true for better understanding placebo effects and their contribution to treatments. But there are also questions that are more clinically relevant, directly clinically relevant, such as does this treatment work for a particular group of patients, um, or does this treatment work better or the same as uh, a, a different approach that's clinically available? And that's, these are questions related to comparative effectiveness and effectiveness often uh, conducted in what's called a pragmatic randomized control trial. So going back to the efficacy part of that diagram, we have an issue here. Um, and I do like to introduce the, the topic often when I talk to sort of the wider pain community um, with the notion that um, well, physical and psychological interventions in particular for pain are quite well sought after. So there's a big interest um, both from a funding side and from a research side and certainly from a patient side in non-pharmacological alternatives and the big background there being um, things like the opioid crisis. So um, considerable harmful effects and, and adverse effects of many, many drug trials, uh, available drugs, but also the fact that for pain and, and non-specific pain in particular, uh, it's been a while since a, a really effective um, drug or surgery was was um, proven or, or studied. So we have this interest, but we also have a lack of either studies at all or a lack of high quality efficacy trials. So like I said, in psychology, for example, efficacy trials are basically not conducted. Um, and in many other interventions as well, the studies that are conducted are quite rightly criticized for their methodological flaws or problems. And what's often and almost always pointed out in this field is that blinding and placebo controlling is really, really difficult in these, in these trials. And that goes so far that um, when, when designing, um, when creating clinical guidelines, for example, the argument that blinding is not possible in, for example, psychological trials was used to um, completely disregard the need for such trials and say, well, if we have comparative effectiveness trials, then that's fine. We're just going to use them as the highest available uh, evidence. And then if you look at acupuncture in the in the one of the some more recent NICE guidelines, that wasn't accepted as a as a useful evidence standard. And they were kicked out, or that recommendation was kicked out based on, on a completely different type of trials and a different different evidence standard there. And why is that such a problem? You've got the the principle of placebo controlled trials um, here encapsulated in in a pill where you take out the active ingredient. And like I said, how do you do that? How do you do that in one of those complex multifactorial um, interpersonal, interactive therapies here. With that in mind, we set out at the beginning of that PhD, of the PhD on which this is based to develop guidance for control interventions. Um, 
It's uh, the question of, of blinding and how that relates to, to treatment outcomes. I think just to say that um, it's generally thought that blinding is, is really, really important. But uh, if you look a bit deeper, it's debated. So whether or not participants actually know what kind of treatment they get is not 100% clear. And thinking about open label placebo trials, there's certainly an indication here that knowledge um, of what you're getting is not always uh, the most important factor here. And you've got other meta-analyses that show no effect. And this probably, if you're interested in the topic, is the most recent meta-epidemiological study, something to look at where they synthesized 47 systematic reviews and concluded there was low certainty of evidence that the magnitude of the effect is modest. So relatively um, good indication that, that blinding does make an make a difference. Um, but apart from whether or not um, it influences uh, trial outcomes, it certainly, um, whether or not uh, the, the design for control intervention influences blinding, it certainly influences placebo effects, as I've showed you with the analysis beforehand. So I've described what the issues are. Um, and with that in mind, or with that material, we then went into a Delphi study and interviews with stakeholders to draft a guideline that's now been published in the BMJ, which is recommendations for the development, implementation, and reporting of control interventions, specifically to efficacy and mechanistic trials of those interventions that we're targeting here. So this hodgepodge of, of different control interventions, absence of quality control, et cetera, Hopefully, if this statement is, is followed, it would at least be reduced a little bit. Uh, I know that might be quite a naive view, but that's my hope. Let's briefly go through some of those recommendations here. Uh, and I'm aware that we've progressed in time in this, in this webinar, and I won't hold you for too much longer. Um, this is publicly available and open access, so do access it if you're, if you're interested in it. Uh, lots of... Um, Lots of discussion around how to interpret and these trials are important and, and what the challenges are there. I'm bringing up the complete author list, mainly to say thank you and to acknowledge their contribution. Um, this is really something that, that was a team effort and had a lot of input from many, many smart minds and very experienced people. The core of that development process was a, was a Delphi process, which invited experts from clinical trial research and from the placebo uh, placebo world to take part. We had three rounds of Delphi's, uh, Delphi surveys, so where people were asked to rate whether or not they thought certain recommendations would be important, and ended up with consensus that 68 items were relevant and to be included in the final guidance. I then drafted such a guideline and also turned it into um, material for interviews with potential patients in such trials. So people with lived experience of, of pain were interviewed and asked about their views on how they, um, on what would expect them if they, if they were to enter a trial that was designed based on those intervention, uh, based on those recommendations. And that was then discussed and contextualized in consensus meetings. And the result is this COP statement that really focuses strongly on the conceptual and practical development of control interventions. So before you actually go into the trial and then on quality assurance during a trial, we also make recommendations on the reporting of control interventions, expanding on a reporting checklist here. So a COP statement is both a methodological guideline and a reporting guideline that has the big advantage that has been um, taken up in the Equator Library, which is a library of, of reporting guidance. I've also, um, I don't know if you if you noticed that, tried to minimize my use of the words placebo and sham in the context of control interventions. And that's one of the recommendations that came out here as well, to avoid those terms because they can be misunderstood. They mean different things to different people. And especially sham uh, can be a term negatively connotated to people entering a trial. We've benefited a lot from involving people with lived experience, and that's certainly also something that comes out in the guidance to say both patients, but also other stakeholders, such as the providers in the trial, are important to work with from the beginning of the project to assure 
that what you're planning to do in a trial is acceptable and will lead to the desired um, quality control interventions. The core principle, um, which is the lowest one in that list here, is to replicate as many components in that control intervention of the investigated treatment as possible, apart from the components whose effect the trial aims to study. So very much that same principle from a drug study, where you're taking out that active ingredient uh, in conceptual in in non-pharmacological interventions. The important part here is to define those mechanisms of interest, and even if you aren't 100 certain what they might be it's important to be clear and explicit about them and then um, take out components of the treatment that you think might be acting on those on those interventions um, even if the theory there is not particularly clear by doing those trials uh, it hopefully will become a little bit more clear we also make a very strong recommendation that during the trial, the blinding status of participants, so the effectiveness of blinding, should be assessed if that was an objective of the trial. So if you're planning to do a participant blinded trial, there really is no reason not to ask for blinding to be assessed at some point in the trial. Um, certainly something that comes with much more nuance when you read the actual, the actual recommendation framework. Um, but that is is of an, a novelty and certainly an upgrade of what you see in, in other reporting guidelines, for example, at the moment, or a stronger recommendation. I think for this webinar, it's more interesting to talk more about how to interpret trials like this. Um, and if you see an efficacy trial that shows a small effect, you must remember that this can only ever reflect the efficacy of that treatment component that was specifically studied, so the one that was avoided in the control intervention. Um, that's not something that you can directly translate into whether or not that then works in clinical practice, or which means that the treatment package as a whole, if it's a complex uh, multi-component intervention, that the treatment as a whole is not useful. Um, that's something that requires iterative testing, more studies, or different types of, of RCTs as well. We do need more clarity, like I said, about why those trials are conducted and why control interventions are designed the way they are designed, and more quality um, assurance and, and um, following of, of best practice recommendations. For me, still a conundrum and something I'd like to get into a little bit more is the comparability between effect sizes in, in trials like this um, compared to placebo controlled drug studies. Uh, we do tend to classify effects as small, moderate, and large, but I do wonder whether and how that is, is comparable across different types of studies. As you've seen, um, it's pretty unrealistic to expect the expect, um, same kind of effect size if all you're taking out is one of the many potentially active ingredients of a, of a complex intervention. This is a quote from the COP statement, which says that positive signs from an efficacy trial with a well-designed control intervention should ingre increase end users' confidence in an intervention under real-world conditions. So even if an effect size in the efficacy trial is small, as long as you can demonstrate some kind of between-group difference here, that's something that should make you more confident that, that, that there's something uh, of interest and for clinical benefit in that, in that uh, complex intervention. In the end, what it comes down to is that the research question is clearly articulated and matched to the study design and vice versa. Um, if we have a mismatch between research question and study design, for example, asking um, a more a too broad a question with an efficacy trial, the whole concept goes out of the window and um, you may end up with uninterpretable trials or with misinterpreted trials that don't really add benefit to the to the body of the literature. So here, just another little mark, um, I don't know how to call it, advert, that the question of pragmatic trials is also something that, that we've addressed uh, together with impacts. So we've put out an impact statement earlier this year, and there's another one in, in production, which makes um, recommendations about when a more pragmatic design or approach to trial design is, is appropriate and how to balance um, internal validity, so bias control, 
with the generalizability of dry result. So the last couple of slides, hopefully becoming um, a little less abstract if you're, if you're a clinician, what are the, the clinical implications from that material that we've just discussed? I do think we can say that placebo effects and mechanisms are generally relevant for non-pharmacologic practice, potentially even more so than in, than in drug or surgery related interventions. But we can't be sure about the extent, but it's certainly not zero. The predictability of those effects is, is really difficult. And there may be or are most likely interactions with specific effects and factors. We do know that the education in many of those therapies is much more focused on what's core in the, in the theory of those, of those um, therapies and disregards that many of those contextual factors also will, will have an effect on patients. So we do have to pay more attention to all parts of the treatment of that whole experience. And here's a nice um, straightforward paper by a couple of colleagues of mine that said that we must um, include contextual factors in our consideration of, in this case, um, manual therapy interventions. What we certainly can do in clinical practice is to evaluate expectations that people bring with them. Um, why are they here? What are their previous, expecta uh, previous experiences with this? What do they hope to get out of it? And how much trust have they got in, in whether or not the intervention can help them? We must remember the importance of placebo mechanisms, that they are there, that context factors exist, and that we can uh, embrace them. I like to call that as to the placebo effect as your friend and not your foe, something to be to be um, to be harnessed really, which involves paying attention to context and to language. Here's a dark music playing in the background, and that is to introduce the dark side of the um, of this the theory and, and of the concept, which are nocebo effects. And let's just see if this works. Um, that's been, yeah, that's been. Okay, so it's here, foot injury. Okay, you just get you to stand up for me. That's been going pretty viral on uh, Twitter in the last few days. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a, it's, um, it's called when you see a physio, and that's why he, why he talks people through for about a minute. Okay, you're standing wrong. First of all, that that's you're standing wrong. Okay, just walk to the end of the thing. You're walking wrong. So you stand, so that's your problem. So you're standing and walking, your spine's in the wrong place. Your spine's in totally the wrong place and your hips, your hips shouldn't be where they are. So you feel where your hips are there? Incorrect, shouldn't be there. Suck so your stomach muscles in for me. Imagine you're holding a big old poo. I said, imagine you're holding a poo. Okay, now release them. You've shit yourself. That's a problem. You've got a weak core. You got a, what it is because your core's weak and your spine's in the wrong place and your hips are all wrong and you can't walk or stand properly. That's why you're getting these problems. If you've got a tennis ball at home, you know, if you've got a golf ball at home, if you've got a cricket ball at home, okay, we'll get, get, buy all of those. Uh, um, office, no good. Sat down all day. That's your problem. You sat down all day. Your spine, your hips, everything's in the wrong place. Can you do anything else? Builder, no good. On your feet all day, no good. Those are shoes you wear, get rid of them. They're, they're doing you no favours. Get rid of them. Your neck's in the wrong place. Just looking at you now, your neck's in the wrong place. The main thing is, though, with injuries, is to stay positive. Right. Sounds like a bit of an exaggeration, um, but I can assure you that a lot of teaching uh, is along those lines. Yeah. Where's the, where's the error? Where's the mistake? Where's the fault in the system? And how can the human mechanic fix that? Um, and unfortunately, that's a pretty appealing concept to to patients and providers and students. Um, it's much more alluring to have straightforward uh, black and white answers than trying to positively uh, influence someone's outlook on their on their condition and enhance someone's self management or even just coping. So um, the theory here is, or, or something we've put forward in in one of the uh, studies that you see referenced here is that it's often down to the, the underlying thought models of many of those interventions 
that then drive communication um, to patients and then interacting with patient predispositions. So, for example, the force believes that they bring about injuries and, and pain, etc., into the treatment context, interacting with those, potentially reinforcing those, and then leading to negative expectancies um, and potentially adverse nocebo effects that you that you aren't going for. So you might be reinforcing um, fear and negative expectations, but I don't think we can keep that to nocebo effects in that in that um, narrow definition. I think we need to look at more and broader undesirable effects, even things like, well, my spine is in the wrong place. I now need to go and see someone who can put it back into the right place, making me very much dependent on someone else rather than enabling me to to live a fulfilled life without having to pay 80 quid a pop once a week because otherwise my neck will fall off. Um, we, yeah. Very proud. I don't know if you get the the allurance here to the dark side of the moon, but um, that's where that's coming from. So really inviting people to reflect on potential undesirable or nocebo effects that may stem from from treatment context, from things that they communicate consciously or unconsciously to their patients. Um, it should be said that like, the the evidence base for nocebo effects from those context factors is much less strong. The theory is that we are generally more alert to averse information experiences so potentially these can be can be can be even stronger than placebo effects um, but to date the evidence doesn't doesn't give us much one way or the other um, certainly no harm in reflecting on your clinical practice uh, through this prism of nocebo and other undesirable effects if you're in clinical practice so Wrapping up the entire webinar, and I thank you very much for your for your patience. Um, maybe take a couple of moments to reflect yourself on on what your uh, take home messages are, where you see need for further development or or um, information gathering or clinical clinical reflection. For me, open questions are: which studies do we need more of? Um, what are low-hanging fruits, so things are easily implemented and translated and likely beneficial in clinical practice, and how can that be studied? Um, and this should have come first, how certain can we be of the current evidence? So even in the, also in the placebo field, um, yeah, you see relatively so strong, large confidence in, in the placebo effect as, a, as an important phenomenon. I think we've, we've seen that it does exist. Um, but that the picture is certainly blurred with, with some methodological uh, issues from underlying experimental and randomized control trials, uh, but also complex interactions with, with treatment effects and, and multiple context factors don't allow us to make the very strong and very clear uh, statements. So I'll leave you with those and would like to end by thanking my supervisors and various collaborators that were part of, of um, this work, notably the many volunteers and, and co-authors of the guidance statements, but in particular the systematic reviews that were underlying those, those guidance statements. Um, it was fun to work with them and it wouldn't have worked uh, to do those big projects without their support. Thank you for having me today.